I'm Kim Foden. I live in Kirkwall, have done for all 71 years. And I'm going to talk about, I think, uh, about <laughs> my dad and my uncle and sort of things that they got up to when they were fairly young lads. The two brothers, I think they had their careers a wee bit mapped out for them. Um, my dad, the elder brother, um, Jack, he was to go to university in Edinburgh and uh, he studied English, Latin, philosophy, psychology. I think my grandmother had the church in mind for him, but they also had the Orkney Herald newspaper and my grandfather was owner and editor of that newspaper and obviously would need help with that. So whether they hoped that he would do that, I'm not quite sure, but certainly it wasn't science. And he was so always quite sad about that. And I think maybe a bit jealous of his brother, who was the second son, James or Jimmy, as I call him. I think they were quite lucky. Their, their father really took a great interest in their interests and both from both of the boys from a very early age were fascinated by technology, uh, electricity and in particular radio and radio waves and how all that worked because uh, they were born in 1910 and 1914 and things were just really kicking off. Uh, crystal sets were only around in the 1920s really so uh, their uncle actually owned a newspaper shop business, Leonard's here in Orkney, and they were very lucky. He would subscribe to all the different magazines, you know, that were coming out for young folk, boys and adults too. They, like everybody at that time, they would make they made crystal sets, uh, very simple, uh, which needed earphones and or you know some sort of method of listening to this very weak sound um, and those things some of them had to be bought not just acquired from scrap so uh, their parents did support them very much and then when valves came into being and amplification they just had to had to move on to these kind of Frankenstein looking sets and try to build those. But they did talk their father into buying um I think it was called a Fury Four, a four valve receiver. That must have been late twenties, I think. Or I think. Yeah, it would have been. Um, but of course my uncle, I think he was in a way the driving force. They were both interested but he was quite fanatical and went on, this was his living later in life. Um, and he was quite sure that whoever was transmitting these signals would be transmitting a whole range of audio frequencies and he wasn't getting this full range. He wanted the bass sounds, the frequencies. So this set had to be taken to pieces, rebuilt, amplifiers built, every different configuration. And eventually, I don't know if it was with that set, but he eventually did manage to get these bass notes in his receiver. The boys knew, they'd heard that uh, experimental transmissions were going to be um, sent out from Baird's own studio in London. And I think their early experiments in receiving were from that station. So this would all have been done just at home in their house, probably just with one radio that they needed to receive these uh, sounds. It was a, a it's a sort of drrr sound that was sent um, and they would have worked with that and tried to amplify it, tried to resolve the picture and it, they wouldn't have made much fuss about it but th themselves they would have known that these would have been the very first television 
pictures to be received in Orkney. And in fact, really uh, in the north of Scotland, I would think pretty well. Bits were gathered together in preparation for the big switch on of these experimental transmissions. They made a cardboard disc and this had to be really accurate because the placing of the holes in a spiral on this disc on the edge really was the key to resolving the picture because that had to uh, synchronise with a flashing light which was driven by the signal that they would receive, hopefully, away up here in Orkney, miles from London where that was just where it was intended to be transmitted, you know, for that area. So um, a bicycle lamp wasn't taken to pieces, but they needed the lens from the front of the bicycle lamp. So they just hung the whole bicycle lamp with the, the thing open so that they could use the lens as their lens to, to view the image, which was only a, a very small, I think it was one and a half inches or I can't remember. Oh dear. Anyway, very small picture. They needed a motor uh, to drive this wheel at the correct speed. And so they acquired a DC fan heater. And he said it was German. I don't know where it had come from. Uh, that I've just got some information from my uncle long, long ago. Um, so they had this DC motor. They had the valves. They knew how to build an amplifier to amplify this weak signal. Um, they, they had the disc. They had the lens. Then they just had to adjust the speed of this wheel, this uh, spinning disc. And that had to be very, very accurate, the speed, again, to synchronise with this lamp. And they decided there weren't lovely rear sats and things like, you know, we had later on. They just um, reduced <laughs> the power by experimenting with the uh, bulbs, electric light bulbs in series and in parallel until it came down to almost the right speed. And then the final tuning was a piece of string over the shaft of the motor that they could absolutely adjust the, the speed of that disc. People who were being televised, they would have a lot of makeup on, very green, dark shadows under their eyes and green to, you know, just to make their, their face, give their face a shape. Able to see with these just 30 lines. The image itself built up in your mind, only one spot or one hole in this disc was actually passing this flashing light at one time. And during that time, this bulb would either be on or off or in the process of going from on to off. So it was a black and white picture that built up with these 30 holes spinning past this bulb and your, your mind would, you know, create a picture. Once my grandmother discovered what they were doing, I think she probably told her neighbours and word got around. Uh, the BBC then, in the very early 30s, decided to have a competition between the Baird system, which was the spinning disc system, and um, the cathode ray tube. So experimental... Transmissions were sent out from Alexandra Palace uh, after normal radio transmissions ended for the day. So this was very late at night, you know, sort of, well, for me, <laughs> quarter to 12, 12 o'clock, you know, half past 11, round about then. And they published these times in the Radio Times. Not very exciting programmes, but there they were. Uh, and hopeful people, neighbours and friends, would come round to the house and if conditions were right, if these signals were strong enough and there was a picture, they were sat down in front of this spinning disc 
with the lens right in front of their face and they would be told how to adjust the speed of the disc until an image would appear. Uh, and it would sort of be very stripy, run off to the side, uh, and, but eventually would settle down and there was this very stripy image. James went off to Edinburgh to do more scientific subjects. Uh, he won a scholarship then to a university in London and carried on with his career in electronics and his interest in television, just radio waves, brought him into, um, a, well, got him a job with Marconi, actually. And he was, I think, Marconi's engineer at a Daventry, big transmitting station there. So he was there, he, quite an important job. And during the war years then, he was taken over. He was part of a think tank with the Admiralty or working for the Admiralty. So he, he went to work in London with a small group of people and they were given tasks to try to perform, resolve. Uh, one thing that he worked on was the Superboy or a Superboy, which was a device which was to be placed underwater um, and emit, emit a signal, but only if the device was interrogated by a friendly ship or aircraft. If it was interfered with, uh, or if it was interrogated in the wrong way, it had to self-destruct. So this was the, the remit. This was to guide either shipping or aircraft into a specific location. And just radio signals from underwater was a difficult thing. But to actually work out the logic then for it to do certain functions was something a bit specialised that I don't understand. It was armed, so Marconi had to send him in the submarine to the Mediterranean to actually arm them and put these devices in the torpedo tubes and deploy them. And it's something he never, ever spoke about. I didn't know until after he died that he'd been part of that team. Uh, my dad, Jack, during the war years, got to dabble a bit in what he was really interested in. Although he loved literature and he loved the, the editing the newspaper and, you know, and helping his parents and working in the printing. But the war years gave him a wee bit of freedom to think about things he wanted uh, to think about. And he thought that radio would be much um, handier, or what is the word, yeah, to use in the field in warfare, rather than rolling out landlines and using field telephones, VHF radio could be adapted. But of course, it wasn't always so secure as these lines. But anyway, he did help to develop or worked on a little VHF set that was used widely and was used for a long time after the war, the same valve sets. It didn't take long before the television repair people in Orkney grabbed him to help repair TVs and set up TVs in people's homes. Uh, this was 1961, and just when the televisions were arriving in, in Orkney and everything was happening. VHF. So he was quite happy. The other thing that was going on at the time too was stereo, uh, stereo sound. And he would go and set up stereo speakers and receivers in people's houses and get that good sound. You know, that was his passion. Uh, he, he was very happy. It was kind of unofficial, but he was very busy and he was doing what he loved doing. Our house was stacked full of people's TVs waiting to be fixed and he worked in workshops in town as well. And then there was a vacancy at Deca Navigation 
in Dunby. And for his last lot of working years, he went to work as an engineer in the Deca Navigation Station in Dunby. And that was a happy time as well for him. He was amongst people there that had a common interest. And he was a radio ham and he had time to get back and, and do all those things. Moved to Bursley, put up a great big aerial, drove back and forth to the Deca station and came home and played with his amateur radio sets.